Assalamu alaikum. Dear learners, in this part of the video lecture, I am going to talk about different concepts related to quantification of system reliability in an industrial setup. But before that, we should define that what is reliability. So, any ideas? You might have used the word reliable for your friend if he is available for you whenever you need him. Or you might have even used this word for a certain device if that device doesn't fail you or is functional whenever you need it. You might have said that it is a very reliable device. Using these examples, we can define the term reliability. So it is the ability of the system to perform its required function within specified working conditions for a stated period of time. This means that a system is able to perform what it is manufactured for. Now, it is very tough thing to quantify reliability. And the main reason behind it is that what counts as a fault. Normally, the device is available, but it may has degraded performance due to a particular fault. Now, will you count that as the device being unavailable or faulty? Moreover, if you have purchased a certain equipment, then to define its reliability, you first have to define the failure. And then you have to calculate mean time between failures. And to do that, you need to record at least a reasonable number of failures. I can give you an example of a car tire that may get punctured after every month. For the first few months, you won't take it seriously. But after that, your mind will automatically calculate mean time between failures. And whenever approximately a month has passed, your mind will notify you that your car tire is about to get punctured. You might have experienced this thing in many other situations as well. The mean time between failures is not an absolute measure of reliability because it is just an approximation. Let us go through an example to understand mean time between failures more concretely. Suppose that you are logging the history of failures of a certain instrument installed in an industrial setup continuously for 360 days. And this is the data which you have logged. The instrument met first failure after 11 days of use, then you repaired it. And over here, we are supposing that you repaired it on the same day. And after repairing, the instrument worked for 23 days before failing once again. Similarly, the next failure came after 27 days, then 16, and so on. You continued this exercise for a complete year, and at the end of the year, you had 18 total failures. So dividing 360 by 18 will give you 20 days. That is, the average time before the instrument will fail. Or you can also say that the mean time between the failures. You can also get this 20 by taking the average of 18 numbers you got over here. The example we just discussed supposed that there were 18 failures in 360 days. But how can you do this exercise for an equipment which has a large mean time between failures? For example, there might be an equipment that won't show any failure in complete 360 days. In such a case, you can't just wait for years and years to record the data of the failure. For such instruments, you have to rely on the mean time between failure prediction provided by the manufacturer. As manufacturer has manufactured a number of such devices, he has observed multiple devices for a period of time. And if you multiply the number of devices with a period of time, then you can say that you have observed one device for a quite long time. Let me clarify this thing with an example that for example, you had one device and you monitored it for 20 days. And in the other case, you had 10 devices which you monitor for 20 days. In the second case, you can multiply 10 with 20 to arrive at 200. And now you can say that you have monitored a single device for 200 days. Over here, we are assuming that all 10 devices were exactly the same and were used in the same condition of working environment. Therefore, a manufacturer can figure out mean time between failures by using the formula shown over here. If he has observed n number of instruments for t time, then the total time for which he has observed the instruments can be figured out by multiplying t with n. 
and dividing this thing with the number of failures will give us mean time between failures. In the previous examples, we suppose that whenever an instrument fails, it has been repaired on the same day. But this seldomly happens in real life. Therefore, we need to consider the mean time to repair or replace the instrument while calculating the reliability. In such cases, the term reliability is sometimes replaced with the term availability and is defined using this formula. You can easily see that maximizing the mean time between failures and minimizing the mean time to repair or replace will increase the availability of the instrument. Although we can somehow approximate the mean time between failures and the availability of a certain instrument, but we should also consider the type of instrument which we are using. Normally, electrical instruments display a different kind of failure pattern as compared to mechanical instruments. A newly manufactured instrument will show increased number of failures as compared to a little bit used electrical equipment. This is because of the fact that most electrical components require what we call burning in before they can be reliably used. Therefore, normally whenever a manufacturer manufactures any electrical equipment, he will test and run it for a particular time before delivering it to the market. On the other hand, mechanical instruments will not show this kind of behavior. After the initial transitionary period, both mechanical and electronic devices will ideally give you a constant failure rate for the coated life expectancy. For example, if a certain equipment has been coated to work for five years, then I believe for five years it will show constant failure rate. But after that, the failure rate will grow exponentially. Therefore, keeping the track of failure rate or the mean time between the failures is of immense importance because it will tell you when you should replace the component instead of getting it repaired. Apart from proper use, there are certain other factors that will affect the reliability of any instrument. The first and the foremost thing is the choice of instrument. Choosing a low-cost, unreliable equipment will definitely get you in trouble. Secondly, how you are protecting the environment from hazardous environmental changes also contributes towards the overall reliability. Thirdly, whether you are following a regular calibration exercise or not will also affect the reliability of the instruments. That is, if you are using the instrument, if it has gone out of calibration, then it means that there was some problem with either the usage or the environmental conditions that drifted the instrument out of calibration and you are still using it without any concern. And lastly, redundancy can greatly improve the reliability of the system. And by redundancy, I mean that you have multiple equipment to perform the same task so that if one of the instrument fails, the other instrument can fill in the gap and the whole system will keep on working. A simple example of redundancy is to use multiple temperature sensors in a certain area to measure the temperature. In this case, if any one sensor malfunctions, the other sensors will keep on providing the temperature data and the overall system will keep on measuring and monitoring the temperature of the area. While talking about reliability, how can we forget about safety associated with any system? Whenever a system or part of the system fails, the first and the foremost thing should be to ensure the safety of other devices and of humans if they are present around. Therefore, safety systems are an important aspect of any industrial setup. Their primary purpose is to monitor the parameters associated with the whole system and take some effective measure if those parameters sway or deviate from their normal values. The idea over here is to avoid any dangerous situation. Example of such safety system is an electrical breaker installed at your home or a simple fuse attached in series in any electrical supply. The purpose of the breaker or the fuse is to cut off the electrical supply if the connected electrical component demands current greater than a particular value. As flow of large current can initiate a fire or can be hazardous to humans, therefore, as soon as any device demands abnormal amount of current, the circuit breaker or the fuse trips that system off. In any industrial setup, depending on the type of failure, 
the action can be either defined as simple sounding off an alarm or a complete shutoff. You might have also experienced that in car nowadays, if the driver doesn't put on the seat belt, the car will keep on giving a beep or an alarm, but will not shut off the car completely. The international standard of IEC 61508 defines that how an industrial safety system should be designed and installed. This standard gives guidelines related to various aspects of a safety system and for certification an industry needs to follow these guidelines. The whole standard is divided into three major parts where the first part deals with the designing, implementation and maintenance of safety systems. The second deals with the competence and training of the personnel or the workers who are involved in designing, implementation and maintenance of safety systems. And lastly, the third part defines the technical requirements for any safety system. Therefore, this standard addresses all the aspects related to safety systems. Simple implementation of safety system is not enough as by this standard. You have to hire or train the workers to properly utilize the safety system. And there should be a proper mechanism for validating the competency of the engineers or the workers who are maintaining the whole safety system. A key feature of this safety standard is the safety integrity level, abbreviated as SIL, normally pronunciated as SIL. This level defines the degree of confidence that a safety system will operate correctly. Correct performance means that the safety system will initiate the required response if something goes south. It is the job of the designing team to define the response such that humans and other equipment can be saved from the harm's way in case of a failure. This standard also defines the risk assessment procedure to figure out the SIL value. As far as continuous operations are concerned, SIL value of 4 means that the system is most reliable. You can assign a SIL value of 4 to a particular system if the probability of dangerous failures per hour is in the range of 10 raised to power minus 9 to 10 raised to power minus 8. Or if we define failures in a year, then this value should be in the range of 10 raised to power minus 5 to 10 raised to power minus 4. Similarly, if the probability of dangerous failure has some higher value, then a lower SIL value will be assigned to that system. So, a SIL value of 1 means that a particular system will show a dangerous failure with a probability of 0.01 to 0.1. You can additionally say that if such a system is used 100 times in a year, then there are chances that it will fail dangerously 1 to 10 times. A typical safety system consists of three major components. The first component is the sensor that will sense the situation. It can be a simple sensor to sense the temperature of some liquid flowing in the pipe. You might be monitoring the temperature of that fluid so that if it rises above a certain point, you should take some appropriate action. If this sensor gives any abnormal output, then the trip amplifier or a small control system, you can say, will generate a signal to sound the alarm or to actuate a certain actuator to shut off the complete system. Moreover, to increase the system reliability and in fact the safety system's reliability, normally one safety system is not implemented, but there are layers of safety systems. As the whole operation in the industrial setup is dependent on the working of a safety system, therefore a malfunction in the safety system itself can cause a serious problem. Therefore, in practice, two out of three voting system is used, that is, Three safety systems are installed in parallel and if two of them signals a problem then a corrective action is taken. However, if only one of them is saying that something is wrong then normally nothing is done. You can relate this thing with some everyday examples as well. For example, if you want to know something about a thing to purchase, it is not wise to ask for opinion from a single person and make up your mind. You will always ask multiple sources and then if majority of them are giving the same opinion, then you will make up your mind on that opinion. With this, I would like to end this video lecture and hope that you have understood the things which I have tried to convey today. 
Thank you and take care.